Hey guys, what's going on? Today we're talking about the five essential quantum fields and the mother of all fields, the metric field. But she's not a quantized field yet because, well, probably the biggest problem in physics right now is trying to generalize, or the, the biggest problem in physics right now is trying to incorporate general relativity and quantum field theory. It's pretty hard to do just because gravity is such a weak force it's really hard to study and you can't really make gravitons and particle accelerators. Anyways, there's a Nobel Prize waiting for whoever wants to, or whoever can figure it out. The first and most familiar field that we all are familiar with is the electromagnetic field. And that's because it's responsible for light. But it's a composite field made up of two other fields, which are basically the electric field and the magnetic field. So they are what make photons or light and it's like you can't see this field even though you can't see this field even though that it's responsible for providing vision yet you like you know you, you can't touch it you wave your hand through it it's like there's nothing there so it's kind of like you know remember chaos she's the primordial mother in ancient greek mythology and she gave birth to heirs which are basically nothings that are something which is kind of like a field it's like a nothing but it's a something and fields are physically real and if you want to know if you want to know the electromagnetic field in a more intimate way just go get yourself a sunburn and then you realize that okay there's energy coming to me from the sun and it's it's being propagated through an electromagnetic field so the field is obviously real and it has energy in it and you can think of this field as ubiquitous throughout the entire universe because you can imagine placing an eye between here and Andromeda and you'd pick up electromagnetic radiation because you'd see both galaxies. So it's everywhere. The next familiar field is of course the metric field and the gravitational force, this concept has been replaced by a metric fluid which allows things like gravity waves and the curvature of space-time to take place Gravity waves have recently been confirmed at LIGO when it actually like space and time squished and modulated itself along a perpendicular axis and it proves gravity waves exist so it proves the metric field is the mother of all fields and not only that and not only that she's the one that tells uh, photons how to behave Actually, you could say it this way. Frank Wilczek writes it in his book, A Beautiful Question. Energy momentum tells the metric fluid how to flow, and the metric fluid tells energy momentum how to behave. Or you could say it different. Energy momentum tells space-time how to curve, and space-time curvature tells energy momentum how to move. So it's a, like a yin-yang relationship. The mother of all fields, she's not quantized yet, as I said and a Nobel awaits the person who quantizes this field. Okay, then we have the strong nuclear force field that is mediated by eight color gluons, and they're like sticky little photons because they're massless and travel at the speed of light, and they can find quarks, or they dance about with quarks, and they can find them in the nucleons of atoms, and it's their dance that brings up mass. And I've said this before, and this brings us to the quark field, and quarks are our first matter field, and this matter field gets, gets its mass from the Higgs mechanism, but it's still barely nothing. Like the quark field is barely getting any mass from the Higgs mechanism, but it's getting all its mass with, with regard to the quark field. But your mass, my mass, real heavy mass, is a product of quark and gluon jiving dance. And when they get together, because quarks or because gluons move at the speed of light and can find quarks, it's their vibratory dance or oscillation that brings about mass by the inverse of Einstein's equation, m equals e over c squared. So you get mass from energy. And that's basically how the quark-gluon field works. So that's the matter field and the other force field. And then you have the other weak force field, which has the W plus and minus and Z bosons, which is, these are the weak ons, and they just mediate like neutron decay or beta decay. It's kind of a boring field, but it's recently been confirmed that the weak field is actually um, the electromagnetic field. So the field now is called the electroweak field. 
So there's two quantized force fields, the strong nuclear force field and the electroweak field. The other non-quantized field is the metric field. So those are three force fields. And then you have two matter fields, the quark field and the lepton field, which harbors the electron and neutrinos. And the electron, too, it gets its mass from the Higgs mechanism. So the Higgs, of course, is the, the Higgs is the oddball field. It's a scalar field in that it doesn't have a direction. It's not going anywhere. It's just literally like a cosmic ocean. And it just sits there. That's why most people call it a molasses. Or they use molasses as an analogy for the Higgs field because it's just like a soup. It's just a cosmic soup sitting there doing nothing except providing an interaction that gives quarks and leptons their mass. So this lepton field gets its mass from the Higgs mechanism as well. And like I should point out, like the electrons that constitute your body, that make up your body, is about 21 grams on average, which is like nothing with regards to mass. So you get all of your mass from quark and gluon relationships, and that's described by, of course, quantum chromodynamics. But the essential nature of all these fields is that they're immaterial and irreducible, like you can't make up another field out of other things, unless string theory is true, but there's no proof for that. There's no experimental evidence of string theory, and a lot of mathematicians who are really smart people are making a lot of contributions to string, string theory. I don't know if it's going to pay off, guys. I don't know. Um, so basically, the fundamental ground of reality is fields. That's the major point I want to make, and I believe uh, well, if you get into supersymmetry and the unification of forces and stuff, a lot of physicists are working towards a unification. Quantum field theory is just one such step along the journey towards unification and proving that we all do share as common a universal ground floor. Not only this, but relativity also implies a shared and necessary ground floor. The fundamental idea to take away from this is that the fundamental ground of reality is fields and even the hard objects, the solid objects that we look out and we, you know, stub our toes on and bump our heads on, these solid objects, their essential nature is also that of fields, immaterial fields. And this to me is a lot closer to consciousness than solid particles because consciousness is immaterial and irreducible and fields are not material and irreducible. So in a few, in the next video, well, not in the next one, but in a, in a few videos from now, I'm gonna to present to you guys my idea of what I think consciousness is by basing it on a field view. And it's like, why well, I don't think, I, I think I gave it all away already, but anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and as always, thanks for watching. Even though neutrinos don't really have mass, <clears throat> Why the fuck don't neutrinos have mass? I don't neutrinos have mass.